Hey all, welcome to another interview. A special two-time guest is with us today, Dr. John Flett. John, welcome along. Thank you very much. Uh, for those who didn't see our first interview, John is the author of The Witness of God, The Trinity, Missio Dei, and Karl Barth, uh, in the, and the Nature of Christian Community. There you go, almost got it all. And Apostolicity, the uh, Ecumenical Question in World Christian Perspective. And John is also the coordinator of studies, missiology, and Pilgrim Theological College, part of the University of Divinity. So that's you, John. Uh, but we're here today to talk about something you're doing at Pilgrim, yeah. which is very exciting. Because um, we actually, in our last interview, we touched on a course you were running on um, multicultural and migrant churches in theological, political, and spiritual perspectives. And then just later, you started hinting at and slightly releasing on Twitter info on a new course. I thought that was a very nice uh, drip way to get it out there. Uh, and this one is uh, Political Popularism and Theological Discourse, which is also running under the title on Pilgrim's site, Conversations, Interdisciplinary Theological Perspectives on Contemporary Issues. Uh, could you give us a broad overview of the course and what you hope can be achieved through conversations such as these? Uh, yeah, so, you know, we all went through the Trump apocalypse, yes. and, uh, and now we're on the other side, and uh, I suppose we, I was watching the election live, and someone posed, some of my colleagues posed a question to me about uh, who would we go, or where would we go to come up with some sort of theological way of processing what's going on, and I thought, well, that's a, good, that's a very good question. I mean, where do we go? The typical and a lot of people have gone to sort of Bart and Bonhoeffer, uh, and I like Bart and Bonhoeffer, but you could, I just feel that there's got to be something more. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a range of other voices out there that we can engage with. I think they're important, and they sort of speak to a certain way of dealing with things, but I think we can enlarge the conversation. So uh, I just made a website and thought I would try and hash it out. The reason that there are two titles is because universities can sometimes move a bit slow. So I had some, a course that uh, would fit, I suppose, uh, what's going on. So that's the conversations course, and, the, and it, it allows us to do interdisciplinary work within it. So yeah. put the populism course within that. So the, the thing about Brexit and Trump is that I felt really out of the loop. There was, there was this big discussion about the faith, about Christianity, about its role in it. Uh, there are a number of voices, quite you know, explicit people with the self-describing as Christian, and they were completely outside of the discourse of Christianity that I personally would associate with the person and work of Jesus Christ. So I think we all got in our little theological bubbles. So sort of way of trying to get out of my little theological bubble and try and work out what's going on. Uh, there are a number of issues, theological issues, that developed through the discussion. So identity. I think there was a clear fear on a number of people that have come out, especially with the sexuality debates in the US and the sort of reaction to that. Um, notions of purity. What is purity? Law. How does the law relate to it? How do we actually legislate for behaviours that we would like to see or not see? Uh, pluralism of different variety, cultural pluralism, religious pluralism. How do we deal with all of those? Secularisation, you know, the feeling that we're losing something. So all of these, uh, all of these themes developed. So they were popping up all over the place. Everywhere you turned, there was, there was another really heavily... Uh, a, a, a theological theme that had major gravitas, especially within the field of mission studies. And it was coming so thick and fast and people weren't really processing it. And there were claims that were being made and, it, you know, it, it just didn't seem to be a healthy way of, of engaging in theological discourse. So the course itself is going to look at a number of these themes. So it's going to try and define populism. What is populism? And then it's going to look at some of the things which I think have been a number of the underlying type of uh, thematics. So, for example, uh, religious vision. So the role of something like eschatology. How do we think about eschatology and how does that translate into policy formation? Hmm. But also the way in which binaries, I mean, the abortion debate is very interesting, the way in which binaries come about. 
I saw a stat the other day that abortion rates were down under Obama. Mm. So in other words, even if you're against abortion, legislation, simple legislation might not be the best way of doing it. Education, contraception, a range of different issues. Uh, racism and religion. Mm. I mean, we've got all this discussion about, uh, yes, you know, we should be hospitable as Christians. However, uh, this is more important than that. So we pretend not to be racist. And yet the, the overriding logic or the sound, the, the message that's coming out is clearly a racist message. And then you get this big self-defense reaction. Why is that developed? Uh, secularization and pluralization, massive themes. Uh, what does it mean to live in a secular society responsibly as a Christian? What is the public space that we can engage in? How might we do it? And there's, I mean, I found some very interesting material where evangelicals and Catholics are really much aligned on a number of the different issues. So what's going on there? Uh, globalization, migration. I don't think, I mean, one of the elements to come out, I think, is that everyone's fed up both with neoconservatism and uh, neoliberalism, mm. but is Trump the answer? Uh, what is globalization? How is it impacting migration? Uh, then we get multiculturalism, identity politics. How have those things developed? Terror, terrorism, theology and terrorism. Uh, terrorism is an issue, but also how do we interpret terror? How does this appear within the media? Uh, which I think is a different... So you've got terrorism, and then you've got the interpretation of it. And I think those two things need to be separated out a bit. Uh, social media and the construction of truth. Mm. I mean, you know, we're talking just a couple of days after alternative facts yeah. have come out. I mean, wow. Uh, how do we think about that theologically? So all of those things are really uh, part of the course. Yeah, great. I and mean, that's a huge amount, which is very exciting and, and, and getting into so much that we're seeing all around us. Like each basically one you brought up, like a news story or an event was popping to mind as we were talking about it. How is the course going to be taught for those who are interested in engaging? So this is a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get to the course? <laughs> well, let's, get to, let's not put that at the end. Let's do that now. <laughs> um, so at, at Pilgrim, it's set up as a sort of three weekend intensive course. Uh, I'm wanting to do an online component where we'll probably spread, try and spread it out over three months. I've set up the course. That, so there's a website that uh, has each one of the weeks with the reading. Uh, I think I might try and, I, I think that the, the point is it's a sort of process course. It's let's start identifying themes, let's start identifying theological resources and let's discuss it. So there's some just absolutely fantastic material out there. But I, I mean, I'd quite like it if we could, you know, encourage students to read, which is challenging in itself. But once students have read, then we will uh, sit around and, and sort of discuss what we think are the key things that are emerging for this, but also identify positive theological resources that uh, can help us in, during that. You know. Yeah, great. Uh, the, the website John's mentioning, it's um, statusconfessionis.com. I'll put... Status Confessionis. Oh. Status Confessionis. It's a, it's a Latin title, oh, which... There you go. Is, that, which means that something has uh, reached the standard that requires confession against it. Mm. So that makes a lot more sense. And I just saw it like broke it up in three uh, <laughs> different like English words. I'm like, okay, okay, cool. There it is. <laughs> so status confessionis, for example, apartheid, mm. was something that reached the level of status confessionis. Uh, Hitler, obviously, was something that reached the standard of uh, status confessionis. So it's basically the church making a proclamation that actually we need to stand against this. Mm. Oh, that's great. That's, um, so I'll put the link to it down below. And on that, it's got a heap of the, uh, the readings. It's got a way to connect, uh, to suggest themes, to engage. So uh, people can check that out. It's a really great resource to have, uh, even if you can't make it to the, down to there. But there isn't hopefully going to be an online component. So stay tuned to info in that regard. Uh, so popularism, as in the title, is a term getting attached to moments like Brexit, the election of Trump, even the kind of uh, re-emergence of one nation here in Australia. 
Now, while these aren't monolithic or homogenous moments or movements, they share some similarities. Uh, what are some of the characteristics that you feel mark this form of political popularism? And when did you start to think like there's a global trend happening here? So populism is not new. Uh, you'll find, well, I mean, you can go to places like Hitler to start pointing to uh, where it is apparent. But a lot of the political literature starts in the sort of late 60s, starts to deal with it. And it comes in waves. I mean, I think you could probably, in some respect, look at the uh, Obama election. There's also a wave of populism, a different type of populism, but still that, which is to say populism is not in and of itself necessarily bad. Uh, Bretherton has some excellent material on, on populism and social activism, how these things go together, community formation. So populism by itself is not something to uh, react negatively to. But I, I happened across a couple of very interesting uh, defining quotes of populism. And one of the quotes uh, discussed it, and it's on the, I actually included on the website, but it discusses populism as basically the setting up of a binary us versus them. And the us are a virtuous people who are under threat. So in other words, we, we had somehow think of ourselves as a, as a people that are containers of the truth to some respect and we feel that our, our rights, our identity, the way in which we want to conduct our lives are being impinged on by whatever. Mm. Now, the second part of that is the people that impinge on it are characterised as the elites. So you'll see a big discussion of the elites and you know um, Trump talking about taking it from the elites in Washington and giving it to the people. And you'll find uh, other, the marginalised. So, for example, the elites are the ones that are forcing uh, sexual reproduction rights upon us, so abortion. The elites are the ones that are making us live next door to Muslims because of immigration. And that's interfering with the way that I can be me. Uh, a number of very interesting things for me in terms of that quote, one, in terms of that definition. One of them is that there's this great confusion about how someone apparently so narcissistic and megalomaniac and moral as Trump can gain such large evangelical support. Mm. So if you think about populism as the integrity of our people, the purity of our people, it is the people that hold the morality. So whoever the leader is, it's in some respects irrelevant because it's the people themselves that are the virtuous ones. And the people just require the laws to be put in place that allow them to be virtuous. So you'll see one of the interest, one of the languages that, uh, one of the topics that come up quite a bit is religious freedom. Mm. So what's religious freedom within this discussion? Well, one of the things that you'll see come through is the idea that there's legislation for gay rights. So for example, if I'm a cake maker, and a gay couple want me to make a birthday cake, I want to turn around and say no, because I don't believe in that. But the law is going to turn around and say, well, actually, you can't discriminate based on race, sexual identity, or anything like that. So you have to make that cake. Uh, so then that becomes, for a group of people, a way of religious freedom being denied. So that's where the virtue, or that's where the, the self-conception of virtue lies. So whatever Trump, Trump does, Trump does. Hmm. The key point is he's going to create the space for us to be the pure people that we need to be. So I think that's where a huge danger attaches. Because, God, I mean, if you don't have proper character and you're in leadership, it's, it's a great concern for me anyway. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's really good. I, I think um, it was interesting. I'll see. I, I can find it really quickly. But uh, the uh, Alice Workman, who's the Australian political reporter at BuzzFeed, was sharing out some things that Corey Bernardi had written in his uh, newsletter uh, about Australia Day. 
and he was talking about how Australia Day is under attack by historical revisionists, PC social justice warriors, and assortment of other fringe dwellers uh, as a pretty good example of a, you know, creating an us, particularly in like the elite of, you know, people who, you know, maybe know the actual history um, and uh, concerned about it. So that, that kind of dynamic was just something that came to mind as you were talking about it and showing the, you know, perhaps the emergence of him trying to generate a populist movement as this Australian Conservative Party uh, here in Australia. Well, you see, I, I think it's, I think you can see it in clearly within Australian rhetoric. And I think one of the, so one of the elements of it is that the left around the world is really dying off. So in New Zealand, for instance, you have, you have centre right, and then you have more right, right party. Mm -hmm. You don't really have a centre left party anymore. Uh, one of the concerns clearly with Hillary was that they just forgot the poor. Mm -hmm. That disappeared from the narrative, you know, in all the debates, the poor wasn't there. So we're seeing it all over the place, which actually makes the which actually makes the course itself fairly vital and for Australia. I mean, yeah, you know, 100%. yeah, that's great. Uh, so, I imagine the analysis and critique of these kind of movements would uh, provide a unique set of challenges to uh, preparing and studying a course like this. Um, that may require you and and those studying to go beyond the usual methodological tools of of theological inquiry. Uh, is this the case? And uh, if so, from what academic fields do you anticipate you'll be drawing from? So, as a missiologist, you have to be interdisciplinary. Yep. <laughs> so, I drew a lot. So, we're drawing a lot on interdisciplinary material. So, sociology, sociology of religion, uh, political theory, philosophy, anthropology, uh, discussions about race for instance, they all appear, uh, intercultural theology and hermeneutics, hermeneutics, philosophy, I don't know if I mentioned that one. Uh, so we're drawing on a number of different fields. Uh, the unifying key, I think, is that they're all trying in some way to talk about the role that religion is playing in this discussion. So, I mean, I've got a... I found some very, very interesting material. One, interest, one part of it looked at this thing called the uh, corporatization of Jesus hmm. and looked at the way in which major themes of eschatology, of economics, of power, have all gone to form a certain understanding of what, who Jesus is and how Jesus works his way out in the political sphere. Now, the author of this clearly is not pro-Christian. Right. It's, it's, and you can't blame her. Because if this is her picture of what Christianity is, I ain't that either. Yeah. In fact, I would be completely against this picture of Christianity. Mm. And she's looking at this through the lens of... So she's writing this before Trump. All of this stuff's before Trump. Mm. But really, she starts talking about these messianic corporate figures that rise up and, and become political leaders. So she's foreshadowed this by a good five or six years. This, and, and she's... She's used a, a number of theological themes to try and describe it. So that actually causes me pause. Mm. You, you sit down and you think, well, how do we actually get there? And then how do we actually sort of say, hold on a second, there are major sort of perversions of theological themes that are going on there. Cultural accommodation of the faith, how do we actually think our way beyond that? Yeah. Great, thank you for that. Um, beyond the just the uh, nature of mission studies being interdisciplinary, are there other ways that you feel uh, mission studies assist the process of looking at uh, movements and moments like this? So, as I was working my way through it, mm. the populism element for me really is bubbles. So there are a number of bubbles that are being formed and People are very quick, I think, to use the language of ideology to describe things. I don't think that we're, I mean, there'll clearly be people that are rigid on both sides, but I think the, the, the major majority of people just aren't holding an ideological line necessarily. Uh, I think the left and the states on here have a very huge problem speaking to a religion mm. in a way that the right is not. Uh, but it's that mess that missiology is good with. Hmm. 
So missiology gets into problems because it precisely deals with that mess. And it can't, and, and when missiology comes down and says, this is the truth, this is actually how it functions, this is where we've got to go, it's where it runs into difficulties. But it can help us to sort of discern elements of cultural accommodation. It can put different voices into com conversation. It can start to point to major themes and why they're important. And it can actually set a, a positive theological framework that says that the gospel is about local appropriation of the message. And this local appropriation needs to find expression somehow. And that ex those expressions have to be put into a communal relationship. So you may have a very strong evangelical voice in the States, but in so far as it can't deal with issues like guns, mm. in so far as it's not actually th theologically thinking about that as, a, as a something that you've got to deal with, in so far as it's thinking that uh, the best way to deal with abortion is just simply uh, legislative denial and getting rid of things like education, contraception, and the whole range of different things that are going. You can actually theologically think your way through those. And I think missiology helps you simply by trying to say, what is the culture in this environment? What is the gospel in this environment? How are those two things going together? And within that bubble, how is another one trying to come in and speak to it and force these things into conversation? Uh, of course, that's a, probably a definition of missiology that many people aren't necessarily, uh, it's not going to be the popular definition of missiology in many people's minds, but anyway, it's uh, how I would understand missiology. Yeah, that's great. And if you want to know more about how John might understand missiology, he has other courses running at Pilgrim, which are dealing with just that. Uh, but staying here, uh, I wanted to look at the course a little more specifically in one week in particular that looks particularly intriguing, which is in week four, the topic is uh, racism and the evangelical vote, which we touched on a little bit in your earlier overview. I'll just read a section from the, the overview. If there is a single lesson to come out of the 2016 election, it is the apparent and ongoing racism fundamental to American society. In the midst of police killings of unarmed young black men and the Black Lives Matter movement, it would seem that the Christian religious voice has failed to speak with any meaningful power. Indeed, the trend seems more that the white religious voice found in some theological, sorry, the white religious voice found some theological affinity with bigotry expressed in anti-minority, anti-migrant and anti-Muslim sentiments. Nor is this a spe an especially revealing factor with a number of works on the matter issuing from also from evangelical publishers. The revealing element lies in its overtness and immediateness. And this has prompted a number of people to reject their ties to evangelicalism and to defend evangelicalism. So two first questions in a second part to emerge out of this. Uh, to what extent might this just be considered a uh, par for the course of white evangelical American Christianity or even white American Christianity regardless? Uh, and or to what extent has it morphed or re-emerged in light of this kind of current popularism? Yeah, see, this is where we, I think this is where it gets really difficult. Uh, evangelicalism is a huge movement in this. I mean, it's huge. Black and white, every, you know, there's evangelicals along the line. And you'll see evangelical, black evangelical preachers pro-Trump. So there is that confusion. Uh, there'll be a number, and, and I've seen a number that sort of say they're not racist, but they didn't want Hillary for whatever reason. So you'll get that type of argument. And then you'll get the sort of, the thing that really, I don't know, really concerned me was one, the lack of overt statements saying, actually this rhetoric that's issuing from Trump is completely unacceptable. So we, we might vote for Trump, but really, at the end of the day, this is completely unacceptable, this language, and we need to stand against it. The number of evangelical leaders that did that were seemed to me to be smaller. Mm. Uh, the other concern for me, which was a major concern, was the post-facto self-righteous discussion about reconciliation. Because it was from a position of power. We won, and now we're going to bring you back into the fold. So instead of actually getting your hands dirty prior to the election coming along, a lot of them for a lot of them, it was it was occurring after the debates had gone on, and I found that personally that was 
for me, the, just a massive issue. I mean, you, you can go to a number of uh, liberal theological schools in the States that didn't come out as overtly against Trump as I would have liked. So I don't think you can necessarily simply blame it on the evangelical voice there. But the way in which there was this lovely sort of, uh, we're all swimming in the same water. So, you know, we might disagree with the sort of anti-Muslim rhetoric or the building of the wall rhetoric, but not really. Mm. You know, there was, there, was, there was some sort of sense in which winning drove the evangelical debate. We want to win. There is something at stake here that we want to win. We're feeling threatened. We want to win, which is about power, which is about the fear of the loss of power. And it's that power question, which I think really lies at the heart of the gospel, which was poorly... Uh, if, you, if your central figure died the death on the cross, it's all about giving up power. And it's all about giving up power precisely as the empire... So if we, if our figure, if, if the central figure of the faith is Jesus and the central event is this cross event, in the middle of this struggle with power, where you've got an empire that is clearly oppressing a number of people, the death on the cross is the, is the reaction to this empire. It's not picking up the swords and charging it. It's a different type of animal. And I think that there are more theological voices or resources that we could use to deal with these types of questions than the one which basically says that I need to win. Hmm. And, uh, yes, yeah, so that's one aspect of the problem for me. The other aspect is just nascent racism. Just every day in the water, this is how it functions, racism. And, you know, when you raise this in class and you sort of ask, you know, who in class is racist, no one's going to put up their hands necessarily. But I will. Because until we realise that every one of us is racist, we're not really going to be able to, to deal with it. And it, might, it just comes in small little ways. It just, you know, the, the way in which you work. So people will talk about whiteness for instance, and white privilege. It's, it's learning to recognise those little moments and how all that pieces together and how that goes to create something and something quite large and quite powerful. And the, the way in which this is what? If it's not outright denied, it's sort of, oh, yeah, okay, but type of response. Those sort of things just need to be called out for what they are. The good old boy defence. Oh, he didn't mean that. Mm. I mean, all of those, all of those sort of moments are things that we need to stand and say, no, actually, that's not the best way to approach this. And there are theological reasons for this. I mean, this just isn't moralism. There's actually, we have commitments within the gospel that say this is unacceptable. The fact that you didn't get people standing up and saying that. And then the fact that you've got at the end of it saying, oh, well, now we've won, we can reconcile with you. I mean, that's just fundamentally against any theology of reconciliation that I know. Mm. Even political accounts of reconciliation, it's, it's against those. So, yes. Yeah. So a bit of a problem. Yeah, no, no doubt. Uh, it's going to be an important week and in discussion to be having. And uh, so just the second part of that was what voices are you looking to engage with in that week and what do you expect that they'll offer? So each week we're basically going to look at two readings. We're going to look at one sort of a more uh, diagnostic, actually what's going on within the context and then one theological mm. uh, response. So the first thing that we're going to look at is a commentary on Emerson and Smith. So Emerson and Smith are quite known for their, their large work on evangelicalism and race uh, within the US. There is a commentary, well, there's a number, been a number of reactions to it. It's an important book. But then there's this reaction uh, essay that's from uh, Tranby and Hartman, and it's called Critical Whiteness Theories and the Evangelical Race Problem. Now, that's interesting because they actually start looking at uh, less about sort of, uh, how would you even put this? They, 
look less at uh, overt racism. So racism that can be identified as such and start looking at something that Lawrence Bobo called laissez-faire racism. Uh, so on the one hand, you've got this notion of principled conservative ideas. So principled conservative ideas basically says, well, we in principle stand against racism. And we think that this itself might be enough to stop racism. The counter argument is that it's so basic to the individualism that uh, informs a lot of uh, evangelical belief, salvation of the individual soul, the way in which this works, uh, and the way that that sort of individualism blinds people to structural notions of racism. So, for example, I don't know if you know the phrase, you should be able to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, which is a notion that actually, if you did the work, if you stop being lazy, then you would be where I am. And the problem with structural racism is it just doesn't function that way. So when I was doing my PhD, I had an African-American friend and he told me stories about having to take uh, toilet paper to high school. Hmm. And the sort of, the sort of uh, way in which, even now he's in his 30s, the way in which he was processing that in his 30s. See, I never had to worry about taking toilet paper to my high school. What a crazy idea that would be. So one of the reasons they had to do that is because people stole the toilet paper to use at home. So here you have, you know, issues of poverty. I mean, there's just yeah. massive themes that are going on there. And to sort of say, well, you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps as a way of dealing with this racism question through principled conservative ideals mm. is itself a racist way of diagnosing and thinking about the problem. So it's, it's an excellent article. It really is very good. It goes through that. Now, the, the counterpoint, uh, we're going to look at the classic James Cone and look at his work on the cross and the lynching tree and this notion of strange fruit you know, that he brings up and what does it mean? What does it mean to worship a Jesus that essentially the way Jesus is portrayed continues uh, issues of uh, lynching? And how do we, or how do I as a white person, uh, how am I complicit in that? And how do I think my way through uh, and how do I participate in a way which is not sort of patriarchal or condescending, but, you know, it is in solidarity and is humanising. One of the lessons, I think, is that, uh, well, again, the reconciliation question, it's the, it's the offended party that needs to take the initiative. Mm. And the idea that I'm, I am the one that needs to work for it becomes a bit of an issue in itself. I'm the one that retains power. I'm the one that can actually go out and do it. So I think these are fraught issues. And I think the way that uh, I personally want to approach this first by listening. Yeah. And then we're trying to, you know, then getting invited rather than sort of claiming the power that I can, you know, I can mobilize myself to become a, an agent for good. You know, it's the sort of, I am the Messiah complex all over again. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to try and raise a number of those more thorny of theological issues. <laughs> good, good. I like that. Uh, so we've mentioned this a bit already, that during and since the US election, several uh, prominent conservative evangelicals, which was probably a self-designation, uh, offered up defences of the Christian vote for Trump. Uh, now, I remember you sharing some of the more egregious of these uh, under the hashtag WTF theology. Uh, what, if anything, inspired you, uh, inspired this action? And do you feel you've been able to identify any reoccurring characteristics behind these posts? Uh, I mean, we've already kind of mentioned the desire to win, but I'm just wondering other things around that. So WTF theology has to be probably one of my proudest creations. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's it. Yeah, no, so that all started because, you know, I was reading stuff and my initial reaction to it is like, what the fuck? I mean, how is this even remotely possible? I don't get it. Mm -hmm. And 
I mean, I've worked in a number of different places with a very wide spectrum, spectrum of theological positions. So, you know, I'm not some sort of orthodox Nazi that runs around and sort of says you have to hold X, Y, and Z position. But then there are, there are these, I don't know, there are some things that are just completely egregious for me. And I thought that they were one off. And of course, you start to explore it. So one of the ones that really got me was the lead pastor at a church in Bethel, I forget the name of it, he's a mega church pastor, but he started talking about how taxes were, were problematic because it took away from the capacity of the rich to be compassionate. Now, I mean, and he's arguing this theologically, I mean, this is a position that he's mm. trying to argue theologically. Now, by any reading of scripture, I just can't see that. I can't see that as, as appearing in scripture at all, because it basically says the rich can give out of their wealth. Mm. And by taxing someone, and the, the rich really don't get taxed huge amounts, but by taxing someone, uh, they no longer are able to give out of their wealth. Therefore, it takes away their compassion and it takes away from their self-esteem because they can't give out of their wealth. I mean, that, for me, is theologically so screwy mm. as to be crazy, as to receive the hashtag, what the fuck? I mean, really? <laughs> so, oh, I don't know. And then you get, I mean, today I posted another one where you've got the picture of Jesus standing, uh, sorry, Jesus is a ghost standing behind Trump signing things into law. Yeah. I mean, I have no idea where that comes from. Mm. And the issue, for, well, it's recurring themes. I think that there is a um, significant bubble and we all live it. I remember, I remember one day going to uh, the, this, this was a big lesson for me when I went to the States. I went to, so I was doing my PhD at Princeton. One of the Princeton professors was going to the uh, uh, Eastern meeting of the, uh, what is it, the Society of Evangelical Theology. And uh, there were two speakers. The first speaker got up and talked about how the Holy Spirit helps us interpret scripture. And it was making me a little bit annoyed because I thought that is the most benign thing you could possibly say. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, the Holy Spirit helps us interpret scripture. I mean, okay. So yeah. and it was really at the end of that, that there was this half an hour of the most angry and aggressive questioning. And they were basically telling this person that he had to leave his job because he'd given up believing in the inerrancy of scripture. Wow. Okay. So here we have a, here we have a discourse that's in place. And the discourse that's in place has a number of borders. And those borders, if you go over those borders, you are no longer within the crew. Mm. Now, this made me a bit concerned because the professor that I was with could be interpreted as reading that God chose to be triune. Mm. So one of the potential theological difficulties with this position is that uh, God was not always triune. Mm that there was a God before God became triune. Now, I don't think he's necessarily saying that, but that's one of those particular problems. And I knew that he was going to get up and speak along this line at this conference. So he gets up and he says something, and guess what happened? Have a guess. Oh, <laughs> um, everyone was just like, no angry questions. Everyone was chill. He got a standing ovation. <laughs> oh, man. Now, I, it took me, like, I was sitting there and I was exceedingly perplexed. And it was only later that I realized that he hadn't, he hadn't transgressed necessarily any of the main topics. Mm. So one, even though it's an academic conference, there's, there's a lot of non-thinking that's going on. In other words, unless it's within my framework, I just find it very difficult to interpret it. Mm. So what he looked like he was doing was good exegetical work that he was getting applauded for. The other guy was talking about something that I found to be completely benign, and yet I have never seen a more aggressive negative response in my entire time. Yeah. So how do we live in those bubbles? Mm. And I think that there's, there's huge amounts of cultural accommodation in our faith 
It needs critiquing. It needs opening up. And what we end up doing is instead of doing that when we feel threatened, we actually retreat into that bubble. And then we sort of become sacrosanct. We reify it. This is actually the way it is. This is how it should be. So insofar as mission studies forces you beyond your bubble, forces you actually to dialogue with a range of different people on a range of different topics and to actually come up with some sort of decent defense for your faith, for your faith. Unless you're doing that, you are, it doesn't matter what theological position you hold. Unless you're engaging in that movement across borders, unless you're stepping outside yourself to have that theological conversation, you will calcify, you will petrify, your, your theology will die on the line. Because in the true evangelical sense, it's good news to be spoken. Mm -hmm. And if you're not speaking that good news and actually hearing feedback back and looking at how it's being appropriated, look how it's being embodied, look how it's being lived, then you've cut yourself off from the good news. Mm -hmm. And you think that you're possessing it. You think that you have it. And as soon as you think that you have it, then you actually close down. And this is why we run into the problems of colonial mission method, because we think we have it. We think you need to look like us. This is actually what the maturity in the faith looks like. And this is how we uh, will therefore uh, propagate that faith. Now, that's a big problem. Yeah. That, that actually draws us quite well into the, the last question, um, which is about like, maybe the role of mission in this you know, age and this trend of, of popularism in its current form. So uh, the other day you tweeted out uh, responding to one line in the inauguration, which was from Trump, which was from this day forward, it's going to be only America first, um, which, you know, just at the basic level of, you, you know, anything about like, you know, as a Christian, like what the early church or what, you know, how they operated that would be such uh, alarm bells for them. But anyway, uh, your, your thought following it was, I, I hate to think of the mission method following this train. Uh, and in our first conversation around your book, uh, Apostolicity, we talked about how uh, when we often like criticizing mission methods of the past uh, and the way mission was done in the past, we don't think that, some of the responsibility or perhaps lots of the responsibility has to do with the culture and attitudes of the sending church of the culture in which the mission emanated and the view of culture from which the mission emanated. So it seems like that's some of what you're hinting at in the tweet. And so I was wondering, what do you think churches can do perhaps at a practical level of countering this kind of America first thinking and not that America is the only uh, culture engaging in that Brexit was obviously a very Britain first kind of thought process. And broadly speaking, you know, what role can mission play in response, like, well, properly understood, um, healthily understood, uh, in response to this growing populist tide? Uh, uh, Leslie Newbegin, I don't know if you know the name Leslie mm -hmm. Newbegin, a major ecumenical figure um, from the UK, Presbyterian, uh, was a missionary in India for a good 40 years, became one of the first bishops in the Church of South India, a reformed bishop. Uh, he made the following, he made the statement about how he remembers really clearly about as Indian tanks were sort of flooding their way into Tamil uh, speaking areas, how the missionaries followed in the tracks. And the same way with Iraq. Mm. So when America's invading Iraq, missionaries are first ones, you know, flooding in behind. Uh, when I was in South Korea, I asked, so we had a group of Korean students, and it was just the time when, uh, so during summer in Seoul, it empties, it completely empties. It empties for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is that large majorities of Koreans are going on uh, short-term mission trips. And one of the mission trips they went on to was into Afghanistan hmm. during the war with the Taliban. Now, during this, a busload of them got kidnapped. I don't know if you remember this. It made huge news. Right, yeah. Not but a busload of them got kidnapped, and the, uh, the Korean government essentially had to pay a massive ransom to get them back. Hmm. So they got them back. Uh, so they're untrained, enthusiastic church people decide they're going to jump on a bus and drive in Afghanistan. And, uh, of course, there's a huge loss of face, huge, huge amounts of money that's been put into it. And I asked my Korean students uh, to, whether this was, you know, whether untrained short-term missions was a good idea and whether this, this, uh, this 
this special moment in Afghanistan should not have occurred. Now, Koreans, in this context, don't really want to put up their hand. Right? They don't want to answer yes or no. So I forced them to. You know, it was an act of violence on my behalf. But uh, we weren't going to progress until hmm. we voted. Should we or should we not have done that? Hmm. And there's a conflict. There was, a, I mean, and it was a clear conflict. None of them wanted to say because all of them thought that they'd lost space and it was a bad thing. Mm-hmm. But none of them could say actually we did we shouldn't do missions hmm. defined in this way. So that's the crux of our dilemma. And it, there's there's something grotesque that's going on there about the notion of opportunity. Hmm. And the problem with the quote about America first, the problem with the quote about New Zealand first, Australia first, whatever it is, is that we end up defining religion or thinking about religion in terms of the socio-political context in which we live, the way it's framed, how it's embodied, what we think our values are, we're gonna bring democracy. And this bleeds, it always bleeds, it bleeds into what we believe, it bleeds into, it bleeds into how we, we function how we embody the faith, and also how then we think we're going to propagate the faith. And if mission, if mission is defined in those terms, the problems we get are the problems that you're going to see that as soon as we invade somewhere, the missionaries are the first ones walking behind the tanks, and we're going to feel good about that. Now, how mission, otherwise understood, theologically understood, uh, has it got a lot more to do with reception, Mm-hmm. It's got a lot more to do with hospitality. It's got a lot more to do with uh, being in positions of vulnerability. So, for example, uh, a friend of mine was talking about when he was a he was a missionary in uh, in Africa, and there was a, there was a big slum, a massive sort of slum refugee camp just outside where he was, and no missionaries were allowed to go in there. I mean, basically, it's it's ruled by the mafia and you're just not allowed. But he said he was sitting on his porch and every day he saw this group of nuns walk into the camp and then walk out of the camp in the evening. So it's got something to do with power and the whole idea of a white man going into the slums, the mafia is just not gonna allow it. But the idea of these little nuns with, you know, according to these men having no power mm. can actually walk in and then do a lot of work within that area and then walk back out. So, uh, I mean, we've talked, I mean, we've really raised the word power quite often within this discussion today. So how does power function within missions? And if I hold the power, I need to be a little bit self-reflective about what's going on. How do I give up power? Uh, They're not easy questions. Uh, Proclamation of the gospel through vulnerability, through loss. I think those are big issues. Uh, one of, I don't, I don't know if I can't remember if I told this story before about hope. Can I tell you a story about hope? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think so. So, so I went to the Democratic Republic of Congo and I went to the Democratic Republic of Congo in a place called Goma when the M23 rebels were sweeping through it and they chased the army out of the area and we went to where the army was stationed and and we were in a place that used to be a five-star hotel, but hadn't, you know, it was still a hotel, but no one ever came because you're in the middle of a conflict zone and there are two meter high walls everywhere and people with AK-47 sitting on the wall. And, uh, you know, you're sitting there at six o'clock, so it's, a, it's on the equator. Mm-hmm. So the sun doesn't really change. It gets dark at six o'clock and gets light at six o'clock and, you know, how it functions. And you're sitting there having a beer at night and then you hear AK-47s go off in the next street and you hear a guy screaming, just absolutely screaming and you're sitting there drinking your beer and you know that there's no hospitals, mm. there's no ambulances, there's no roads, there's no nothing and you're sort of wondering what the hell's going on. But you also know that you can't leave the compound. So we went and taught, uh, we were shuttled backwards and forwards at 200 meters between one compound where we were staying in the compound where the school was. Mm-hmm. Uh, the day that we left, there was there was a uh, 
strike, essentially a city strike, uh, because they, they wanted roads and the government said no, and the students weren't sure where the school was going on strike. So they gathered outside the, the, these big steel gates waiting to get in, and the police came to them and said, you know, this is an illegal sort of a gathering, you need to disperse. They said, well, we're just waiting for the school to get in. So when the police drove off, they threw a grenade into the middle of the students, ended up killing one and seriously injuring seven. And they're all, I mean, you go there and they just want you to talk. They want you to go and talk theology. They want, I mean, that we have so much privilege here and, and we don't really use it. Uh, there, they just want the smallest bit of theology. They just want you to come and talk. It's, it's just remarkable. Anyway, the, the point of the story is that we got invited to an ecumenical gathering, me and my colleague, and it was an ecumenical gathering of Pentecostals, Neo-Pentecostals, Baptists, uh, Presbyterians, you know, we're all there. And they want to hear from us, which is very uncomfortable for me. And we get up and a Neo-Pentecostal asked the following question. And the question was, what is hope? And it was about how he said, you know, we plant these little seedlings and the seedlings grow and then the rebels come through and rip them out of the ground. And it's always occurring. You know, every six months they come through and they rip it out of the ground. And they were asking us this question. I have no idea. I mean, literally, I have no idea. I have nothing, you know, to pretend that I have some sort of word of wisdom to utter. I mean, we can talk about uh, Jesus being with us. We can talk about comfort in the spirit. We can talk about the sort of the, the same theological rhetoric that they will perhaps use. But what does hope look like in that context? So we go to the cross. The fact is, the hope has got to do with living conditions. And the living conditions are that I will jump on a plane and I'll fly out of there. And I'll go back to running water and I'll go back to power and I'll go back to internet connections and I'll go back to a whole range of different things. So that's one of those, those see, to me, that was, that was mission, really. Uh, well, let me put it another way. We have the, the famous story of Peter and Cornelius. Hmm. And Peter gets this uh, dream about purity and food laws and take and eat, take and eat, take and eat. And then he goes and meets Cornelius. Now, who's converted in that discussion? Because it's not Cornelius. Because mm. Cornelius is already a believer. Yep. See, Cornelius is baptized, but he's already a believer. The person who's converted in that is Peter. And he's converted from some sort of notion of what purity is and how purity is expressed and what is and is not possible for God. Now, that for me is the mission moment. Because if you yourself are not willing to be converted, then you're actually not engaging in the discussion. You're not listening to the argument. If you can't admit to some sort of truth that's going on here. So for me, it's the but and. Yeah, okay, this is good, but. So I'm not racist, but. <laughs> uh, it's that moment where you're actually not willing to hear what someone else is saying and you're not willing to be converted by it. Now, if mission were that process by which you go and engage in a discussion and then there's this meeting where people are listening to you and you're listening to people and there's this mutual con conversion process. See, the funny thing is, they're, you know, in that sense, Peter and Cornelius are both Christians mm. already. And yet there's conversion and change that's going on there. So for me, that's what mission gives you. It's that, it's that moment. And if you're not prepared for that moment, then it becomes threatening. Mm. and you retain power and you're really not able to move forward. Now, that might not give you, you know, if, it might not be the most pragmatic, this is how you get converts that are going to put bums on seats <laughs> uh, type of approach to things. But I think there's something essential in that and, and essentially political in that. Yeah. Oh, John, thank you so much. And it's going to be, uh, it's not 
difficult to see how that will tie into political populism, theological discourse in that we need to start hearing from people who are outside of our, our bubbles and our circles. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, I'll link to the links for both the Pilgrim site and the Status Confessionis, nailed it, uh, site uh, that uh, have a lot of info about the course, uh, but check it out. Yeah, three weekends in Melbourne. If you live in Melbourne or Victoria, check it out. See if you can get along there as part of your study or as part of your continuing ed and formation. Uh, and stay tuned to see if there's going to be yeah for online models to engage. And already on the website, there's reading lists. There's there's like week overviews. There's a lot already there. So if you're listening from somewhere else and want to check it out, hit uh, hit it up because it's going to be really great. Uh, John, anything else you want to uh, throw out there? Final thoughts or plug like no. that? I've probably talked enough. <laughs> good, good. And of course, also check out Apostolicity and The Witness of God. Both have lots of stuff in it from uh, our discussions today. So check them out. And John, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.